Hello everyone, it's Robotic it's Zombie. Welcome back to Along the Edge. So, in the last episode, we dealt with um, Miss Baptiste, Miss John, John Baptiste's uh, mother, passing away after we supposedly put a curse on her, and uh, we turned down the Malterra guy. Um, so it's been a while since I gotten to play this game I went back and I was uh, playing the weird park series as well as house of a thousand doors those videos are up if you guys want to see uh, and so we're still going along the lines of we're skeptical but um, the main thing we have to keep in mind is that we need to reject the Maltier uh, family from getting into the tower and if we need to do witchcraft in order to do that, then so be it. Days go by, and still nothing from Yves Maltair. I must admit I'm a bit worried with what he might be planning for me. I try not to think too much about it. What am I really risking? These stories of curses and witchcraft are just unbelievable. Ismael Terry won't make my car fall off a cliff by putting a needle through a doll made in my image. But that doesn't mean he's harmless, and I'm eager to finally get through this. There's also the Bertines. It's been a while. I'm thinking about Selim Walter from time to time. I'm not sure I figured her out, but I felt there was something going on when I met her at the cocktail party. Perhaps I could call her? Maybe we could see each other again. What should I do? I am going to stick to the bird teens. I haven't seen them in a while. When I knock on the outbuildings door, it's Mrs. Bertines who answers. Oh, hello, miss. What brings you here? It seems she's put her knitwork aside to greet me, next to the fire, in an armchair. I make out the silhouette of Mr. Bertine. He looks at me from behind his newspaper, the local daily news, and puffs on his pipe as I enter the room. He greets me with a nod. I was just checking in. It's been a while since we saw each other. Yes, you're right. Time flies. We heard about Miss Levesque. We were sorry for this poor woman, my husband and I. Smells like another trick of the Maltairs, if you're asking me. Mm. I want to go with it doesn't make sense because we're still going to the step. Bleh, we're still going to the skeptical side. Or. Hmm. Not sure. Because, like, because I certainly think that we did something about that, but our character doesn't right now. I want to go with it, doesn't make sense. But it doesn't make sense. Why would the Maltairs want to get rid of a housewife? Do you mean you knew her, miss? Well, knowing her was a big is a big word. She was the mother of my students and she had how can I put it? Let's say she had some preconceived notions about the Delatoise. Miss Bertine turns white. But, but, excuse me to say bluntly, but have you cursed this poor woman? Before I have a chance to answer, she goes on. Without knowing, miss, how could you have guessed? Did you hear that, Gerard? We should have warned her. Mr. Burton puts the newspapers down on his knees and looks around with a piercing gaze. Come on, Gilbert. You were saying just a couple of days ago that these stories were nothing but stories. 
If I had guessed... You must realize what you're saying doesn't exist, Mrs. Burton. Curses. You don't make people have car accidents just like that, with the power of the mind. I'm afraid you're wrong, miss. You don't know the legends of the village. All right, then. Tell me about it. Feels like there's a lot of things I'm missing about the village, my family, the Maltairs. Hmm, let's get to the first thing about the curse. Tell me what you know about this so-called curse. I can't tell you much about this, miss. The Delatoires were known to be miracle makers, but it's ages since anything like that ever happened. It was before I was born, but they used to say that your family had a gift. Can you tell me what happened with Miss Levesque? Maybe it'll jog my memory. I tell her what happened. Maybe that's the words you said without knowing. And also, your wound. That must be the thing that unleashed the spell. But, no way. I refuse to believe that saying something, anything that could have the consequence of killing someone. Do you realize what you're saying? It's sad your grandmother is no longer with us. She would have explained everything to you. Yes, I guess she knew a lot more about all this. And yet, I still think it's a trick of the Maltairs. It would be very twisted, don't you think? Oh, well, nothing surprises me with these thugs. By the way, Gerard saw Maltair's son, Carr, in the yard the other day. Didn't you, Gerard? He didn't bother you, I hope, did he? Yes, he visited me, indeed. Don't worry, he behaved himself. Ah, I'm glad to hear that. If he bothers you, give us a call. Gerard has long since been looking for an excuse to shoot a cartridge in the rear of this one. Thank you, but I don't think that would be necessary. Let's see. Now let's go back to Miss Levesque. Tell me more about Miss Levesque. You seem to know her. Knowing her is a big word. Let's just say she was the talk of the village some years back. Really? Why? Her husband was a brute. The kind who drinks too much, if you see what I mean. There were several... incidents. It went on for a couple of years. Beatrice Levesque would never be... would never have filed for divorce. And then, Eve Lev... Le Sorry, get my words mixed up. And then, Eve's Maltaire supported her when her husband disappeared. Disappeared? Do you mean... Did he pass away? No. Well, I don't know. Just like that, he disappeared, and it is said his Maltaire would have driven him out of the village. Beatrice Leves was sure it was thanks to the Maltaires, and she was working at the city hall. Well, you better not get caught in saying ill of Mr. Mayor when she was around. I understand. That said, you did a good thing on this one, didn't he? Depends. No one really knows what happened to the Levesque. And even so, a nice gesture once doesn't seem doesn't redeem you from a life of bad deeds, don't you think? But it means her son Jean Baptiste is an orphan. Well, yes, but don't worry about don't worry too much about him. Her aunt took him in. You must know her. She's the wife of the fishmonger, you know, at the market. It's a good family, and I'm sure they'll take care of him as if he was their son. That's a comfort, at least. Okay, now to the tower. Tell me about what you know about the tower and the local legends. 
What do you want to know precisely? You told me the Sphinx was on the coat of arms of the Delatoires. Why? Yes, that's right. You can see it on the family crest. I think it's related to the story of your family. You can see the Sphinx all over the village, and you are a descendant of the family who used to protect the tower and its contents. Follow me, and I'll show you. Mrs. Bertine puts her coat on. I follow her to the tower. She shows me a shield with the coat of arms of the family, carved in boss relief on the outward wall. See? I can clearly make out a tower surrounded by two sphinxes. We silently go back to the outbuilding. But the sphinx has nothing to do with Egypt. Doesn't it look like the one from the Greek mythology? Like the sphinx protecting Thebes, who asks riddles to... Serpidius? Oh. Sepa... Said Dippius. Said Dippius. Okay. Probably butchered that word. Said Dippius, I guess. Oh, uh, well, miss, I can't say. A couple years ago, we saw a documentary on the TV, my husband and I, and we told ourselves, looks like the statue in the village. Do you remember, Gerard? Mr. Burton mumbled something unintelligible without even looking up from his newspaper. What they say is that the region is magic. It used to be a place of pilgrimage in the old times, people coming to be healed or to join the festivities for the passing of the seasons. I can't tell you why, but the legends say that your ancestors used to perform miracles. My ancestors? The Delatoires? Yes, the Delatoires, but it was before they built the tower. I don't know how they were called back then. And. Also, your family had the duty of protecting the village. As the place was said to be magic, it would draw demons, and there were rituals to perform so that the source of power wasn't, po wasn't polluted by these evil spirits. When the Christians colonized the country, the region closed upon itself. People from the village built the tower on top of the source to keep it secret, and the village became a place of memory. I don't know this. I didn't know this period. It was way before I was born. It's my grandmother who told me the stories from before the Maltairs came around. What are the Maltairs doing in all this? It began with E's grandmother, the old Gustave Maltair. When he was a child, the Delatoires took him in at the castle because he had a gift for miracles. He was an orphan coming from the marshes. To be welcomed like that was a great chance, but apparently it wasn't enough for him. He wanted more. I've known him, a little. He was already an old man, but a difficult character. I recall he used to give me the creeps when I was a child. Anyway, it's since about that time that the Maltairs began to amass their wealth. That's when the accident started to happen. Anyone went against the Maltairs, something bad happened to them every time. And then the Delatoires began to go downhill. In the end, there was only your grandmother left, and then you came. Why did you wait to tell me all this? You were from the city. You didn't know any of this. If we had told you about spirits of the forest or magical source, what would you have thought? Yet, we thought it was only old stories. We weren't born at the time of the miracles, and we don't know much anyway, my husband and I. Okay. Wish I could talk with her more. I have to go. Thanks for answering my questions. So, you know everything. Well, Gerard, we told her everything, didn't we? Monsieur Bertin puffs on his pipe, then nods in agreement. We're just the wardens, my wife and I. We were never in the know. Your grandmother, she could have told you, warned you. I 
At this point, I want to know more. I have to know more. Who else can bring me answers? The Maltairs might know more, and yet... Ease, for sure. Then, I'm not even sure his wife or his children know anything at all. There must be someone else, don't you think? Yes, there is. Sophie, your mother. She's the last Delatois to know the secrets. Next. Ooh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to talk to Eves. Is there an option just to go home, or like go to the next day? No, there isn't. Okay. Well, I want to call Celine. When I call Celine, she's a bit surprised that hears from me, but she quickly warms up to the idea of having a coffee together. We meet in the afternoon, in a small tea room with a terrace that opens to a, on a public square. Celine is waiting for me, cup in hand, overlooking her son playing with other children on the playground next to the terrace. The choice of the place becomes suddenly limpid, and I understand the strategic location it represents for the young mothers of the village. But, since my pregnancy accident, I avoid this kind of place like the plague. It tends to bring back a firm dole of bad memories. Though I try to keep my composure as I take place in front of Celine, I guess I don't do any very good job at it since so she asks me with a worried look on her face. Are you alright? I don't tell her everything's okay. I'm alright, I assure you. Huh. Okay, then. Shut you order a tea, or are you more of a coffee person? A tea would be fine, thank you. We chit-chat for a while. We're cut off from time to time by Pierre Eves, who wants to show us a very fascinating stone to ask for a cookie, or to tell us about an incredible adventure that just happened to him in the playground's fort. That's Aline, who finally goes right to the thick of it, telling me from nowhere. So, now that we're through the niceties, we can get to the real reason you've called, don't you think? I'm quite sure Stan has told you about my father's plan, and you want to get it out of me, don't you? Our conversation has suddenly taken a strange turn, and I feel like I'm on the minefield. I'll choose. I'll have to choose my carefully what I say next. Um... No, I... Like, I know she knows, but I'm not going to do that. Marone, I didn't call you for this, I promise. Really? We met at the cocktail party. You seem like a nice person, and that's why I want to know you a bit better. I'm a bit isolated. Alone at the castle, and I just wanted to have a friend at the village. Is it true? In that case, I might have misjudged you. I've been raised in the distrust of the Delatoires, and you seem nice too at the cocktail party, but I didn't believe you might really be different from the rest of your family. It's alright, I understand your reaction. Besides, I can't tell you anything about what happens at the city hall. It would betray professional secrecy. All I can say is that we're doing our best to make you a very interesting offer. Very well. And I wasn't asking for that much. We stay on the terrace for a while more, just enough to sip another hot drink. And then the sun goes behind the trees, and the temperature begins to drop dangerously. So we say goodbye to each other. I still don't know where I stand with Soline. But I have the feeling that our conversation may have taken a very different turn at any moment. Okay, that went well. Why do... I really don't want to do that. I don't like that guy. Days. 
Oh, this is the part that progresses. Okay. Because he's going to have... He's going to have an offer for us. Days. Then weeks go by. And his Maltera continues to shine by his absence. I try to concentrate on my classes at school. But after all these revelations, I have a hard time focusing. And atop it all, the director told me I would be inspected by the local education authority, which adds to the general climate of anxiety. I'm in the forest. It's the same dream again, the one I had last month. I have a feeling of deja vu. Something has changed. I run to escape the presence that follows me. Once again, I get to the pool in the clearing. I draw closer to catch my reflection. It's a different image, as if something has changed. But at the same time, it's more precise and almost more real. I'm wearing a skirt suit, the kind of outfit I've adopted for teaching. My hair is tied in a very tidy bun, and I wear heavy fringe that covers my forehead. I like this image of myself, looking so adult and responsible touch the reflection, and, after a moment of darkness, I'm in the garden again. When I get to the statue of the Sphinx, its gaze is different. She looks forward with defiance and determination. That's when everything changes. I'm moved by the strength and the stability that seems to emanate from the statue. This time, I don't let myself fall into the darkness. This time, I find the courage to turn around and confront the threat the Sphinx is staring at with her inflexible look. That's when I see the beast for the first time. We watch each other for a second that seems to last forever. Then, without notice, the beast throws itself at me. It's when its claws are about to lacerate my belly. <laughs> that I wake up, screaming and sweating. Chapter 5 December Okay, so we're going to end it here and I'll pick this up very shortly. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you later. Bye!